deciding whether or not if you transfer these things that you're engaged in the business, therefore you need a federal firearms license. If you don't got one, then you're going to go to prison for being an unlicensed dealer. Um, this is this is crazy world. This is crazy world. We are the Arms Attorneys. Today we're talking about the worst, most comprehensive rule the ATF has ever in a fiery hellstorm rained down upon this country. We're going to talk about what the change in the law was, who the ATF is targeting with this final rule, and the unbelievable bait and switch we got between the proposed rule and what's actually going on the books. But before we get started, share your support for the Second Amendment by hitting the like button. And if you saw our last video, it really focused on who would be targeted by the rule, but we didn't go into the kind of mechanics of it. So that's really what this is going to be about. Mm -hmm. But there's some really important things here that you have to know about uh, because this rule is, I mean, no hype. I mean, this affects more people than probably any other rule than that we've seen. Yes. And if you watch this channel at all frequently, I hope you will agree with me when I say I am not dramatic. I am not dramatic about the things that are happening in the law. Ma'am. Ma'am, you're being hysterical. Hugh Richard. I am not. And this is, I've been sitting here off camera, like banging my fist because this is, it's drama worthy. <laughs> there. <laughs> But I want to add a little bit of clarification because this came up several times in the comment section in our last video about, hey, look, the ATF doesn't make law, um, you know, rules will not comply. We saw all of that and we totally get it. What makes this a little bit different is the Congress did pass a law signed by the president. And so we have to talk about it just a little bit, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act from 2022. Now, this came about as public law. This is the 117th Congress, so it's 117.159. And so this was signed on June the 25th, 2022. Now, what it did was it modified a definition in 18 U.S.C. 921. And what we added here was, one, we struck out some words. I'm just going to read it word for word. We struck with the principal objective of livelihood and profit and inserted to predominantly earn a profit. So we changed the definition of what constituted engaging in the business and dealing in firearms by that big change. And then we added a term to the United States Code. The Congress added a term to it to predominantly earn a profit. And let's go through that definition. Predominantly earn a profit means the intent underlying the sale or disposition of firearms is predominantly one of obtaining pecuniary gain as opposed to other intents, such as improving or liquidating a personal firearms collection, provided that proof of profit shall not be required as to a person who engages in the regular and repetitive purchase and disposition of firearms for criminal purposes or terrorism. And it goes on. So that is the change in the law. Yes. Now we got that. That wasn't a humongous change as it relates to this provision. Um, the final rule, 400 pages long, we'll say maybe 20 of that is meat and potatoes, but we get 20 pages of regulations out of that. And why do we have this difference between the code and regulations? <sighs> yes. Okay. So um, there is, although we can agree or disagree upon whether or not it should be, but there is a legal practical purpose for the promulgation of rules to interpret a statute passed by Congress. Anyone who watches is tired of me talking about rat poison, but it's the rat poison, right? So when Congress passes a law and they say, you can't sell the American people poisonous food. Sounds good. Yep. That's great. I'll take that. I appreciate that. But Congress are law nerds, and they don't know what is poison or what is too much poison. What's that tiny amount of rat poison I can have in my Cheerios that's actually okay and not going to hurt me? You know who knows that? The science nerds. And so we have these regulatory bodies made up of your specific kind of nerd who is going to say, all right, the law is you can't poison people. I'm the science guy. I'm going to tell you exactly what that means and at exactly what increments this food is safe. Makes sense. So you got the law people passing the laws. You got the science people, right, in this example, looking at the law and saying, this is how we interpret and enforce it in order to execute the will of Congress. Emily's unified theory on nerds. Emily's unified theory on nerds. However, we have here a gigantic abuse of what, in 
theory, and again, I agree to disagree. Some people are like, there should never be a regulatory agency, and I'm getting there with you. But in theory, you understand where they were going with the regulatory bodies, and it has gotten so out of control and so abusive that what we have here is a change in definition that should, I mean, thanks John Corden, Cornyn should never have happened at all, but in theory should stand on its own two feet in the United States code. But no, the Biden administration directs the ATF to make these changes in the Code of Federal Regulations to take the law passed by Congress, those people who are elected and accountable to the American people, and use it to abuse all of us in a way that we cannot control because we do not elect any of these people who work for the regulatory bodies rant over. Well, and up until I would say probably 2016, it wasn't as big of an issue because we have the Code of Federal Regulations mirror the United mm -hmm. States Code. So when you would say, okay, a rule isn't law, well, if the two are mirrored, then I, I don't know that we're making a distinction. We're making a distinction without a difference here, but now we have, all right, law and now the rules and the two things are deviating from each other. But now we got to talk about the mechanics of this, the changes in the definition, who the ATF is going to be targeting, and this kind of bait and switch that we see. But before we do that, we got to hear from today's sponsor, Aura. It's been reported that over 72 million customer records from AT&T customers have been released on the dark web, including both former and existing customers. If my information was part of that exposed, I'm not worried because that's where Aura comes in and does the hard work to keep me protected. You've heard me tell this story before. I tried it out for myself. I Googled one of my sister's phone numbers and immediately found her home address. And that's pretty scary because as a former felony prosecutor, she has her information hidden by law. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need, all inside one app. Aura's app features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, internet parental controls, and protects your devices from malware. And on top of data breach notifications, Aura proactively identifies data brokers exposing your information on the web and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. If you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with our link. Go to Aura.com slash armed attorneys to start your free trial, also linked in the description below. Okay. So now, just as a reminder as to why this change is so important is because when we change who is a dealer, when we change who is engaged in the business of buying and selling firearms, we require that anyone who is in fact engaged in the business get a federal firearms license to do so. And if you don't, you can go to prison, right? You're an unlawful dealer. You have broken You've broken the 18 of the USC, right? You have broken the big part. Yeah, I mean, big picture, what this is saying is we need to funnel all private transfers of firearms through gun stores. I mean, that's right. kind of what, that's what the, they're putting the thumb on the scale for. Correct. So just so people have a little bit of background and they can check this rule out, uh, we're looking at, this was published back on September 8th, 2023, and this is the definition of engaging in the business. This is the rule out of the federal register. It modifies 27 CFR 478, now, the final rule is being transmitted to the Federal Register for publication. It will go into effect 30 days after the date of publication, which I imagine will be before the end of April. So we'll see this going into effect before the end of May, just so that everybody kind of has a timeline of what they need to be looking at. But I think what would do most people or get, give people the most bang for their buck here is going over a couple of key definitions. Now, this, this rule is very, very long, and there's a lot to it, um, especially if you're a dealer and you've given up your license, and there's all these ancillary consequences and things that are going on. But for 95 to 99% of people, there's three definitions you need to be aware of and some legal presumptions uh, when it comes to civil and administrative proceedings. So I think that's where we start. All right, let's do it. So let's start with the first one that I think is real big, which is the definition of dealer. Yeah, let's just do it. Let's get into it. Here you go, guys. Buckle up. Dealer. Any person engaged in the business of selling firearms at wholesale or retail. Any person engaged in the business of repairing firearms or making or fitting special barrels, stocks, or trigger mechanisms to firearms. Or any person who is a pawnbroker. The term shall include any person who engages in such business or occupation on a part-time basis. The term shall include such activities wherever or through whatever medium they are conducted, such as at a gun show or event, flea market, auction house, or gun ranger club, at one's home, by mail order, over the internet, e.g. online broker or auction, through the use of other electronic means, e.g. text messaging service, social media raffle or website, or at any other domestic or international public or private marketplace or premises. 
Now, I think it's important to note between the proposed rule and final rule, uh, there were non-substantive changes to dealer. Um, so we saw this one coming down the pipe. Um, everybody's a, a dealer. Everybody's a dealer. <laughs> Now, the next one we got to go to is engaging in the business, the definition of that. And this is where it sweeps up a whole heck of a lot of people. So that's a person who devotes time, attention, and labor in dealing in firearms as a regular course of trade or business to predominantly earn a profit through the repetitive purchase and resale of firearms. The term shall not include a person who makes occasional sales, exchanges, or purchases of firearms for the enhancement of a personal collection or for a hobby or who sells all or part of a person's personal collection of firearms. In addition, the term shall not include an auctioneer who provides only auction services on commission to assist in liquidating firearms at an estate type auction, provided that the auctioneer does not purchase the firearms or take possession of the firearms or sale on consignment. So, white brow, if it's part of your personal collection, we're all safe, right, Richard? Womp, womp, womp. Womp. Nah, I think that's the, this is, and this is really the bait and switch that we got to talk to people about. So we don't have, again, non-substantive changes from the proposed rule to the final rule, except uh, as it relates to personal collection. Yes, and this is the part that makes us all the angriest. So what is your personal, because your personal collection presumably is safe. Right. Safe, right? You're not engaging in the business. You're not predominantly intending to make a profit, um, right? Because it's intent, by the way. Correct. Bear that in mind. That was in the proposed rule. It's not if you, in fact, made a profit, it's did you want to make a profit? So I could take a bath on a gun, and if I wanted to make money on it, I'm a dealer. Correct. Which is and crazy. Even if you, in fact, lost money on it, yes. but still wanted to, like everybody wants to make a profit, um, that is predominantly motivated to make a profit. Ah, so here is, what is a personal collection? My personal collection is safe. All right, personal collection or personal collection of firearms or personal firearms collection. General definition. Personal firearms that a person accumulates for study, comparison, exhibition, e.g. collecting curios or relics, or collecting unique firearms to exhibit at gun club events, or for a hobby, e.g. non-commercial recreational activities for personal enjoyment, such as hunting, skeet, target, or competition shooting, historical reenactment, or non-commercial firearm safety instruction. The term shall not include any firearm purchased for the purpose of resale with the predominant intent to earn a profit, e.g. primarily for a commercial purpose or financial gain, as distinguished from personal firearms a person accumulates for study, comparison, exhibition, or for a hobby, but which the person may also intend to increase in value. Here we go. In addition, the term shall not include firearms accumulated primarily for personal protection. Provided that nothing in this section shall be construed as precluding a person from lawfully acquiring firearms for self-protection or other lawful personal use. I mean, self-defense guns aren't in your personal collection. Yeah, Who knew? I mean, I guess I appreciate the boldness. Um, it'll make it more clear when it's found unconstitutional. Appreciating boldness is that's for toddlers. <laughs> that's <laughs> when my daughter does something super crazy, and I'm like, "That was very bold." Yeah, it's not for the Second Amendment. No, 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 no that's true. It's the Ron Burgundy, and well, except that I am mad, but also impressed. And you ate the whole wheel of cheese? How'd you do that? It's actually, I'm not even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, Ron Burgundy, I'm not even mad. The cheese. Kind of impressed. Yes. Yeah, the, saying that firearms, which we know the pre predominant, we're going to throw the word predominant around a lot, uh, purpose of the Second Amendment is for defense, and they say that these don't count as guns in your personal collection for purposes of deciding whether or not if you transfer these things that you're engaged in the business, therefore you need a federal firearms license. If you don't got one, then you're going to go to prison for being an unlicensed dealer. Um, this is this is crazy world. This is crazy world. There are all sorts of, of you know, sort of slimy pieces in here that are like, well, it's, you know, I forget if it's primarily or predominantly um, a, uh, you know, competition gun. Well, what Shoot is... Shooting skeet. Right. Well, like, okay. I mean, if I use my shotgun to kill someone, is it then a self-defense shotgun? Richard and I are talking about this offline. Like, I've got my little twenty-two for five steel competition. And if I stop shooting five steel, which frankly I have, um, and now is it just, is it a self-defense gun now? Now it's just a twenty-two. Well, and then this was a scenario we talked about on our last video. We'll link that in the description below. Uh, but you know, if you transfer a gun and that person ends up using it in self-defense and they perform a firearms trace, 
is that now a self-defense gun? Right, regardless Probably. of what Probably your intent. Well, yeah. Well, now it's not and part of your personal collection because it was used as a self-defense gun. I don't know. It's all just terrible. So we've got lots of presumptions in here. And you're probably going to hear a lot of people talking about the presumptions. Presumption that you are um, engaged in the business. Presumptions that you are primarily intending to earn a profit. Those we covered. They did not change substantially. We covered in our last video when the rule was proposed. We'll link that in the description. What I think is just to note about those presumptions is everything makes you a dealer and everything makes you wanting profit. And you'll hear some folks say, oh, but this only applies to civil and administrative proceedings because that's how the presumptions read. You know, it is presumed that in a civil or administrative proceeding, and then we go through these list of presumptions again, I'll have that linked in the description below. But there's a little sneaky provision at the end of this final rule that says, okay, those presumptions, they don't create presumptions in criminal cases, but they are very instructive and courts should use them. Um, which so, means they're presumptions. In which means cases. they're presumptions in criminal cases. All right. I want to talk about the presumption that, that I think is worth discussing here. And they did give us some presumptions that you are not engaged in the business. Okay. So I think this is this is more instructive because everything is going to be construed against you. But we have some little presumptions. Again, not evidence that you are not presumptions that you are not, that they may still try to disprove. So what are those presumptions? Yeah, the first one is a bona fide gift. So if you are the actual purchaser of the firearm, you're using your money for the firearm and you're giving it to another person, assuming it's legal in your state, they're saying that's presumed not engaging in the business. Sure. Occasionally to obtain more valuable, desirable, or useful firearms for the person's personal collection. Reminder, personal collection does not include self-defense guns. So I could exchange one curio for another here, and by exchange, I mean with monies, because that's what we're talking about, and be not presumed to be a dealer. However, if I sell my Glock 43 because I want a Glock 19, that's not a personal collection firearm. That's a self-defense firearm. And so I do not get the benefit of this presumption that I didn't do anything wrong, and I'm going to be presumed a dealer. Yeah. The next one is occasional transfers to family members for lawful purposes. Again, assuming it's legal in your state, they're saying... Those aren't going to fall under our scrutiny, but into a licensee. Into a licensee. So if you're selling them to a gun store, but it can't, it has to be occasional. Mm -hmm. Can't be regular. All right. To liquidate, oh, I'm getting all the good ones. I'm getting all the ones that get my blood boiling. To liquidate without restocking all or part of the person's personal collection. So, hypothetical, if you own hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of firearms and you liquidate them and you collect hundreds of thousands of dollars. You have not made a profit. You are not in the business as long as you never buy another firearm again. However, again, go back to, I sell one gun and I use that money to buy another gun. Whew, I've made a profit. Yeah. The other one is to liquidate pursuant to an inheritance or court order. Again, the government under these or the ATF is saying it's good to get rid of all of your guns. Mm -hmm. if, as long as you get rid of all of them, then we're not going to say you're yeah. engaging in the business. You can sell all you want as long as you never buy another one. Right. Which is ridiculous. Which is ridiculous. Which, which just evidences the point of this whole thing. But I digress. Finally, to assist in liquidating firearms as an auctioneer when providing auction services on commission at an estate type auction. For all those people out of facts. Now, I'm sure the question that most of y'all have is, hey, what is the legal challenge this going to look like? You know, think bump stock, think, you know, forearm braces, especially in the wake of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. And it raises a lot of issues of, you know, who's going to be challenging this? Right. Well, and I, I, I feel sorry for Mr. John Doe, who, who will be in this position. But the best challenge we're going to get is a good person who gets wrapped up in this gets prosecuted for like just selling a couple of his guns and maybe buying another one. Um, and he is going to have standing. He's going to have good facts. And, you know, again, that's heartbreaking because he's going to be challenging it from a federal prison. But that's a great challenge for us. We may see some proactive lawsuits. Yeah, it's going to be. I, I see some issues with obtaining standing on this, um, yeah. you know, I've spoken to a couple of people, you know, you write the ATF saying, I want to engage in the self to be predominantly motivated by earning a profit. You know, give me the thumbs up. And then when they disallow it and say, hey, we're going to prosecute you, does that person have standing now? We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. But uh, 
I think, you know, maybe we have a Second Amendment challenge. Obviously, maybe we have an administrative procedures challenge. Emily loves that love because we have kind of this bait and switch when it comes to personal collection. But there's a lot of things going on with this rule. And I think the biggest kind of takeaway is this rule affects way more people than the bump stocks, than the braces, than anything else we've seen. This rule affects everyone. If you have a gun and you maybe at some point thought about selling any of your guns, this rule affects you. Richard, are you going to be selling any of your guns while this is in effect? Not without speaking to a lawyer. No. And I, I'm, that's, I'm like, well, all my guns are my guns now. Yeah. They're not going away. Because while this is in effect, we are all on the hook. All of us. Everyone is in danger. I cannot stress that enough. And again, I am not being dramatic. Yeah, but we have an entire video talking about the three biggest scenarios that we think that people are going to fall in. You know, this rule affecting yeah, everyone. Who's going to get caught? Who's going to get yeah. caught? So we talk about the three groups of people that we think are going to get caught. We kind of gamified it out and thought about all the different scenarios. And you got to check out that video linked here. And until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys. Let me know when we're recording. I am outraged.